Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's student-led journal club series. My name is Anne-Marie Hayes. I'm a research associate for the Joplin campus here on KCU. Uh, today I'm going to be introducing our speaker, student Dr. Cole Daddle, who actually did research with us this past summer. Um, and he spoke a little bit in one of the seminars a few months back, I think it was the combined journal club uh, lab meeting one that we had. Um, so if you click on the YouTube link or the Canvas link that goes out with all the past videos and you're interested in more on this topic and oral microbiome stuff and also what the MKRC kind of does, I recommend going and watching that presentation. He, Cole speaks along with a couple of other of the student doctors that worked with him over the summer. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce student Dr. Daddle and we'll get started. Student Dr. Cole Daddle is a second year medical student at Kansas City University in Joplin, Missouri. He is, he is originally from Leewood, Kansas and graduated from the University of Kansas with a degree in mathematics. While working in Dr. Schrodinger's lab over the summer, he developed an interest in the oral microbiome and its potential to be used as a health predictor. In his free time, he enjoys playing soccer, running, and watching Frozen with his two-year-old niece, Sailor. Uh, the floor is yours, student Dr. Daddle. All right. Yep. So like I, Henry said, I'm um, student Dr. Cole Daddle. I'm a second year me medical student in Joplin. Um, I do appreciate, well, before I start, I want to thank everyone for being here. Hopefully, as I take you through this article, along with some other articles that I came across, um, you, I'll teach you a thing or two and show you why the oral microbiome is significant. Um, so my article of interest today is um, is some oral bacteria linked with hypertension in older women. It was published in the Journal of the American Heart Association earlier this year. Um, yep, and so let's rock and roll. There we go. All right, so the agenda for today, I'm going to give a brief overview of hypertension and then show how the oral microbiome can impact the um, blood pressure regulation. Then I'm going to take you through the article of interest along and then show you some other studies that I came across. And I think that this is important um, because if associations are made between the oral microbiome and hypertension, then we can be able to detect those individuals that are at a, a higher risk for hypertension and possibly prevent them from developing it, developing it later on. And if this, these bacteria a causative role in high blood pressure, then this can provide opportunities for preventing um, or provide opportunities for treatments of hypertension. And then I'll end uh, everything off with answering some questions. So to start off, I'm going to talk a little bit about, oh, and there's my article. Um, I'm going to start everything off by talking about hi hypertension. So hypertension is, or, um, is responsible for about 7.5 million deaths worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. If left untreated, it can remodel vasculature, leading to strokes, heart, uh, heart, atta heart attacks, and various other conditions. It's classified as 130 over 80 or anything greater, and it's a significant contributor um, when, when left untreated to cardiovascular disease and premature death. And so you may be asking, what does the, micro, uh, the oral microbiome have to do with this? So in 95, Duncan and colleagues actually suggested that it, it plays a role in reducing nitrate. So as you can see in my picture, um, as you intake nitrate-rich foods, such as leafy greens, the oral bact bacteria reduces it to eventually uh, nitric oxide, which plays a role in blood pressure regulation, vascular function, oxygen consumption. In 1993, Ross and colleagues suggested that it may play a role in, in inflammation atherosclerosis. So the bacteria that causes gingivitis and periodontal disease may get into blood, um, cause inflammation and damage the endothelial lining of the blood vessels leading to dysregulation of blood pressure. So the participants of this study, um, so the Buffalo Osteoporosis and Periodontal Disease Study is a longitudinal co cohort study 
that is ancillary to the Buffalo Women's Health Initiative observation study. Um, the osteoporosis study had a five-year follow-up and then a 15-year follow-up in which samples and surveys were given for characteristics, which I will discuss later. And then the, in, the individuals were postmenopausal women. The sample size is pretty robust. And these individuals were 53 to 81. So all of the data um, and samples were, were obtained by the um, bu Buffalo osteoporosis study. So the study groups were divided based on blood pressure. Um, the blood pressure was given in clinic or was taken in clinic um, five minutes after rest, two times two minutes between readings, and then these readings were averaged to obtain one value. The first group was normotensive individuals. The second group was anyone with or yeah anyone with elevated blood pressure, but not on blood pressure medications or or with a history of hypertension. And then the third group are in, um, consist of any individuals that were on blood pressure medications or had a history of hypertension. So the samples were done by dental hygienists using the, the paper point technique. The paper point was inserted into the gingival sulcus for about 10 seconds, three sites per tooth for 12 different teeth. And this was done by the um, by the osteoporosis stu uh, study initially, and at five years, and then um, at fifteen years for their follow-ups. So three different times. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how they took this bacteria and they determined what species um, they were. So this bad boy is a QIA Symphony SP. They put in the samples and this automated machine generated or um, extracted and isolated the DNA. So the classification could proceed. They use the 16S ribosomal uh, subunit to run a piece of, uh, to, to taxonomically classify the bacteria. So 16S ribosomal RNA consists of nine hypervariable regions and nine highly conserved regions. These conserved regions are the same um, with all of the different species of bacteria. However, the hypervariable regions, at, um, as the name suggests, vary between the different species. So by using the V3 and V4 region of the 16S RNA, they were able to PCR it and get all of these different fragments for each species. And this machine also sequenced it. So after sequencing it, they use the basic local alignment search tool, also known as BLAST, which is available on the National Center for Biotechnology Information um, website. And this BLAST allows you to align all of your sequences for these certain bacteria and compare it to a specific database. Now you might be asking, what database did we use? Or did the study use? They use the expanded human oral microbiome database. Um, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, you don't even have to go to the BLAST website. You can just um, align your sequences on this website and classify them directly. And this, um, consists, this database consists of all the known oral bacteria, um, uh, identities and associated sequences with the oral bacteria. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the statistical analysis that was used. So they use ANOVA and its chi-squared test. The ANOVA test was used for continuous variables such as such as age, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and then the highest square test was used for categorical variables, such as self-rated general health and hormone therapy use. And by obtaining a value less than 0.05, they were able to determine that these characteristics were significant, also listed here. And this is important to determine 
because by being significant, they are not independent between the different groups, meaning that they could have influence on the different groups. And so in order to draw a, a better association between bacteria and hypertension, these groups that could potentially cause a bias needed, needed to be corrected for. It is also important to note that ANOVA and chi-squared, while they are able to determine which characteristics are significant, they're not able to compare and contrast these characteristics with, with each other. But that is why they also ran a multiple comparison test. So multiple comparison tests are, is able or allows the researcher to compare and contrast the significant characteristics with each other, further correcting for bias. So this takes all of the possible pairs of the characteristics, for example, age and diastolic blood pressure, age and systolic blood pressure, age and hormone therapy use, all the possible combinations and generates um, a correction for those. So it eliminates bias. However, this is a major problem um, because, for example, if you have three, uh, three characteristics, which the possible pairs for three variables are um, is two. So if you plug in two, you get about a 10% or 0 0.09, which is which correlates to 10%. And this 10% correlates to the chance of a type one error or a false positive. So as you can see, the as the number of tests increases, so you have to do a test for each pair. And as the number of tests increases, your chances of producing a type one error also increases. So for this study, we had nine significant characteristics. So we had a, they had to run a total of 36 tests. This would correlate to about an 85% chance of a type one error, which is not good. So this had to be corrected for, and they used the Benjamin E. Hochberg method. Um, and it is important to note that there are other methods that can be used to correct for multiple comparison. In this study, this method was used, um, but other methods may lead to slightly different results. So now I'm going to talk to you about some of the results. So they took the um, baseline blood, blood, blood pressures and they associated or to see if there's a correlation with bacterial abundance and baseline systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So by obtaining an R value in a Pearson correlation of greater than 0.07, that, um, that's how we know it is significant. So out of all the 245 bacterial species identified in the samples, only three bacterial species were positively correlated with systolic blood pressure, meaning individuals who had higher systolic blood pressure typically had an increased abundance or an abundance of these three species. Then they compared bacterial abundance within the different groups. So out of the 245 total species identified, about 47 in association between bacteria and the specific groups were shown. However, after it is corrected, only 12 total bacteria were shown, eight, eight of which were abundant in individuals with elevated blood pressure, and then four uh, bacteria which were abundant in normal blood pressure. On the, um, initially, there were about 335 women that did not, that were not diagnosed with hypertension. But as the five-year follow-up and 15-year follow-up occurred, about 387 of them developed hypertension. So this made me wonder, why? Why did these individuals develop hypertension and was there a possible were there any associations drawn between this development of hypertension 
and certain strains of bacteria. So 15 were initially found to be correlated. However, this was before they corrected for multiple comparisons. And like I said before, without correction, you may, you may get a bunch of false positives. So then after they corrected for this, they found no significant findings. So despite this last um, association, there were, they still did find some results. And were these results consistent with other studies and how did it match up with previous studies? So previously there were about 25 identified bacteria capable of reducing nitrate to nitrite. These bacteria were not just in the um, gingival sulcus, they were also in the hard palate, tongue, and saliva, and throughout the whole mouth. 13 of these 25 were actually obtained, and of the 245 total bacteria identified. But were any of these significant? So two of these bacteria, um, the corn bac uh, bacterium durum, was higher in normotensive women. And they found that it was actually lower in women greater or equal to 70. So this had me wondering if it actually played a role in, in hypertension. Neisseria subflava was inversely associated with incident hypertension, which could also contribute to potentially um, it playing a preventive role in hypertension. So the study had some a few limitations. Um, the first of which, the oral microbiome, it varies based off your age, diet, sample site, and time, if it's morning or if you're asleep. If you can see in the lower right-hand corner, this picture shows that while you do have some site-specific bacteria, that some of the strains or, the, or species are located in multiple sites. Also, the Benjamin E. Hochberg method, the method used to correct for multiple comparison, that was one method, but it made me wonder if they did use another method, would they find the same, same results or would the results vary? In the upper right-hand corner, I included an article that suggested that instead of using the V3 and V4 region of the 16S RNA, that it might be more accurate to use the V1 and V3 method, or yeah, the, um, the region. So these are a few other cool studies I came across that associated the oral microbiome with type 2 diabetes, post-traumatic stress syndrome, syndrome, suicidal ideations, anxiety, depression. The, um, the article on the right side, um, analyzed three different cohort studies and associated the oral microbiome with lungs, uh, lung cancer, specifically squamous cell carcinoma. And as you can see, the oral microbiome covers a lot of ground and I'm very excited to see future research and hopefully I will be able to do my own research and draw my own associations um, soon. It is important for me to talk about what initially got me started on this project and what initially ignited interest in the oral microbiome. So over the summer, I did research alongside Sarita um, under Dr. Stottinger and with the help of Anne-Marie. And since we did not have the cool QIA Symphony SP, we had to grow the bacteria in um, sheep's blood auger and that limited us to only gram-positive bacteria. And then we isolated the DNA. And we did a very similar classification of the species by using the 16S rRNA sequence or the uh, region. We used the 8F and the 1492 reverse primer. And like I said before, this consists or the 16S RNA consists of hypervariable regions and hyperconserved regions. And the hypervariable regions differ, which allowed us to 
use an endonuclease known as HE3 to cleave at specific sites. And since all of the variable regions are different for different species, this allowed us to generate restriction fragment length polymorphisms that are slightly different in length species to species. And this is something I'm proud of. And this is the 10% acrylamide gel that we ran with our samples. And while we did have limitations um, due to technology and not having a sequencer, we were unable to um, taxonomically identify the bacteria. But we were able to say that A2 and J1 had the same bacteria, but J2 and J1 were different. Um, this more served as a proof of concept study, um, but hopefully we can get a sequencer in the future. And hopefully I can do my own study and contribute to this area. So here are my references, um, and I will happily answer any questions that you guys might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, student Dr. Daddle. Um, great presentation. Um, like he just said, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either raise your hand in Zoom or you can type it in the chat if you can't unmute and I'll read it out loud. Um, Dr. Kennedy, you have a question? I just wanted to give a kudos. Um, what a fabulous presentation. Um, you did such a great job, student Dr. Daddle, and I'm fascinated. I just, I'm so excited that you have a passion for the oral microbiome. I do too. Um, you said something in the beginning along the lines of um, we can identify from someone's oral microbiome how at risk they might be, right? What you can do is actually shape your microbiome either by your diet, the toothpaste you use, um, if you use baking soda or not, uh, a bunch of different things, right? We can actually give you bacteria that you just suck on a little tablet and it completely shifts your oral microbiome. So when you mm -hmm. think about it in the context of hypertension, can you imagine take a, taking a probiotic and just sucking on it every day and never having to take a hypertension medication because we know oh, what yeah. bacteria cause hypertension? So you said that and I was like, yes, and, and I just thought your presentation was so fabulous. So kudos. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, Cole, I'd like to echo Dr. Kennedy's compliment to you. I thought your uh, presentation was real straightforward, well explained. Uh, you have good command of your slides, and uh, um, your your pace, I thought, was uh, was very good throughout the presentation. I've got a couple of questions for you, um, and I say this in deep respect, probably to my ignorance on this topic, but uh, our would you characterize any of these, let's say, uh, bacteria as pathogens connotating uh, uh, an association of further things to come, implicating, you, you listed the risk factor, the comorbidities of uh, a BMI and age and hypertension or uh, hyperlipidemia and diabetes. Okay, we've got that thinking that there's a good risk for hypertension coming. So is it fair to categorize these organisms as pathogenic or just part of that flora? That is a very interesting question. I do think that one of the limitations that they mentioned in this article was that they don't exactly know the mechanisms in which the certain bacteria act on and how and how they impact hypertension and the body in general. So I don't know the criteria for labeling them pathogenic, but I mean, yes, it, if the bacteria prove to be to prove to play a causative role in, in hypertension. I don't see why they wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't say pathogens, or, but negative bacteria or harmful bacteria. Or let's say more of a virulent type of uh, organism. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, then there was one other component that I wanted to ask you about, and it would be mechanism of action, where you mentioned that uh, one of the Neisseria uh, species had some 
protective uh, mechanism or some mm -hmm. uh, preventable, uh, wasn't associated with hypertension. Do we have any postulated theory of how that how that organism would protect? Yeah, um, the only function that I came across regarding the Neisseria subflava yeah. was that it played a role in um, biofilm dispersal and translocation. Um, that uh, corn bacterium uh, durum that played a, or they hypothesized that um, that it its function is reducing sugar into acid. And aspication plays a major role in nitrate reduction. So that was that correlation with that. But um, in regards to the nice Siri one, the only function I could find was in regard to biofilm. All right. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gordon. Thank you. Student Dr. Detell, that was fantastic. You have, I've seen you present before, and you have made a giant leap forward in your research, so I congratulate you. Um, I just I want to, it. Um, it really looks good. I just want to uh, tag on to Dr. Johnston's um, question and kind of give you my viewpoint. I think this is not, this is philosophical and not proven, right? So, but from mm -hmm. my viewpoint as a dentist, whether the bacteria are pathogenic to me relates to whether they're pathogenic in their environment where they are. And once they go into another organ system, such as the vascular system and cardiovascular, because they induce inflammation because they're not supposed to be there, then they cause, you know, uh, I guess I would say, adverse effects or ancillary effects because that's not their home environment. So hmm. I think of it like, you know, the, the oral cavity is part of the alimentary system. And so similar to where you might have, um, you know, you've got your flora in your intestinal flora and those may not be, those could be pathogenic, you know, to your um, digestive system. But then when you get, say, what they call like a leaky or inflammatory um, situation in your intestinal system, and that goes elsewhere, it causes more problems. So like everything in moderation, if it's in the right, you know, har harmony with your biofilm, but then when it enters into another system, it becomes pathogenic, just like if, you know, any kind of bacteria that gets into the wrong place and goes somewhere is becomes pathogenic in that system, but it's not necessarily thought of as pathogenic in its, its home environment. So that's just kind of a philosophy, but I think it's, this is an evolving field. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that more evidence will reshape how we think about these things, but excellent, excellent job. Yeah. Th uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here today and thank mm -hmm. you again, student Dr. Daddle. A great presentation. Yep. Thank Excellent. you everyone for, thank for you being so here. Much. Awesome Appreciate job. it. Good job. Thank you. You guys have a nice day.